loving these talks. Okay. Um, the last talk is going to change the perspective a touch. The, the title is uh, Closing Us Out, Biodiversity Assessment and Conservation Without Species. So this is from uh, Brent Mischler, who is the director of the University of Jefferson Herbaria and professor uh, in integrated biology at uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, let's welcome him. Thanks, Dave. So I'm going to uh, touch on a few topics here that are kind of maximally controversial. It'd be hard to pick three more controversial topics right now in biology than uh, species concepts. Like there's been more ink written on that than any other topic in biology. Um, phylogenetics, which uh, if you've ever been to a meeting of phylogeneticists, you know, look out. And then um, we've been talking a lot about uh, compiled spatial data sets and what are the problems with those. And so I'm going to talk about all three of those. And I'm going to have to um, kind of glide through things pretty quickly in order to get done in time. But I hope I'll at least um, give you some food for thought. I'm going to show uh, citations of papers throughout to illustrate uh, these different points. And they're all, I think they're all open source publications. and. They're linked to from the University of Jefferson Herbaria uh, main page, so you can get to them. Um, I doubt I can convince you or even uh, explain fully um, these methods, but I'm going to do the best that I can. <coughs> I wanted to uh, thank my um, collaborators to begin with, who are listed down there at the bottom, and of course, National Science Foundation for funding. So, if you've seen me give a talk before, uh, I've been writing for, I think it's 35 years now on species, and the, my, if you want to know what I currently think, there's a citation there in the lower left, which is uh, definitely an open source paper and um, goes into the, what I think the current situation is. But basically, even if we leave aside a lot of the controversy and say whatever species are, the best that they can be is some cutoff on the tree of life, going along with um, Sarah's diagram that she had in the last um, talk. Um, you know, some groups are finely split, some groups are more coarsely lumps. And what we have to hope for, and also connecting to Lisa's talk, we want to at least hope that what we're calling a species is a branch on the tree. But it's a crazy uh, hedge trimmer's uh, trim, or a drunken hedge trimmer's <laughs> cut through there, where there is no way, no matter what species concept you have, that you can make the ones that we have comparable. They're just a cutoff at best, and many of them are not even that. But the you know, carefully defined phylogenic species are at least a branch on the tree. But if we stick with those for understanding diversity and evolution, then it's like we're just looking at the uh, icing of the cake without looking at the whole cake. Their lineage is smaller than species for sure, and their lineage is bigger than species for sure. And ideally, we want to take into account the information that's provided uh, by the whole tree. This is true for both biodiversity assessment and endemism assessment, which has to do endemism, the way I'm treating it, is a relative measure that is the inverse of your range size. So endemism means not uh, living in a very broad area. It isn't the absolute endemism of being restricted to some particular unit. So I'm going to proceed on this. This just illustrates the concept of phylogenic diversity, which is what I'm going to be leaning on. If we take 14 tips of the tree, if we count how many tips of the tree there are, there are 14 of them uh, in um, either of those two diagrams. But you see, the one on the left, the 14 are closely related, and the one on the right, they're scattered. So the measure of phylogenetic diversity that I'm going to be using adds up the branch lengths between the tips and would say that the assemblage of 14 on the right is much more diverse than the assemblage of 14 on the left. So I'm going to be talking about PD, or phylogenetic diversity, and some modification of that. Spatial phylogenetics is enabled by some uh, data advances and some technological advances and some theoretical advances 
We now have, as imperfect as they are, we now have large distributional databases of taxa that we can at least begin to use, even though they do have another number of problems of comparability and so forth that we've been talking about at this meeting. We have an uh, exponentially growing gen bank. So we have an amazing amount of DNA sequence in GenBank, and you can actually build the phylogeny of a big flora, uh, at least a, a bunch of it, um, just from sequences that are already available. And then if you do a little more sequencing yourself, you can fill it out. So we have data-driven, that we have technologically driven. When I was a graduate student, it was very hard to build a phylogenetic tree of more than about 10 or 20 things. And now we can do a phylogeny that has thousands of things and get a reasonable uh, estimate of it. So we call that spatial phylogenetics. It's oriented toward the landscape, not toward particular taxa. So our aim here is to find places on the landscape that have concentrations of biodiversity of various values, summed across uh, at least the whole flora, if uh, not the whole biota, although we haven't tackled adding animals to this yet. So the um, first paper that I'm going to talk about is uh, cited there, and that's an open source one. In this one, we looked at the, we built a phylogeny for the California flora. We uh, took CCH as it was at the time we got it and cleaned it up and manipulated it some. We were then able to look at taxonomic richness, which is just how many tips are present in a place versus phylogenetic diversity, versus endemism of the tips, which is WE, and endemism of the branches, which is PE. PE is a modification of phylogenetic diversity where you weight the branches by how widespread they are, by the inverse of how widespread they are. So the more range-restricted branches are longer than the ones that are um, widespread, and then you measure PE on that. So these are the raw patterns <coughs> But we need to generate hypothesis tests to see whether the patterns that we're seeing are interesting or just sort of what you'd expect if taxa live together at random. And so we do spatial randomizations where we take the, the data off the map and we put it back on randomly with a couple of constraints there to see whether the PD and PE measures we're getting are something remarkable or just sort of the null hypothesis just plants live uh, randomly together. So when you randomize PD for California flora, without going into a lot of details here, the dry parts of the state particularly are highly phylogenetically clustered, which means the organisms that live there are more closely related to each other than they would be at random. And then there are some amazing places, including nearby where we are right now, the blue squares, where the organisms that live there, the plants that live there, are more distantly related than they should be if they were assembled at random, which is called phylogenetic overdispersion, which means it's as if relatives have pushed each other apart a little bit, and there are ecological, at least potential ecological explanations for those two patterns. So PD itself is interesting, but you can also look at a different measure, which is looking not just at the PD, but the distribution of the branch links themselves. Can we find places that have lots of long branches maybe refugial type places where there are taxa that have been, lineages have been there for a long time. So that's the blue. And then the red is where the branches that live there are very short. Those might be centers where diversification is happening uh, enough to detect it across many different uh, groups. So this is PD based where we're not taking into account the range size. If we take into account the range size, that's phylogenetic endemism. We do this analysis called canopy, where we can sort of parse out areas where there are significant concentrations of phylogenetic endemism into places where that is due mainly to rare short branches, which is a center of new endemism, or rare long branches, which is a center of paleo endemism, or is some mixture of the two. And many of the hyperverse areas are mixtures of the two. So that's what's in the the uh, furthest left uh, map there, blue is centers dominated by paleoendemism, red is centers dominated by neoendemism, and purple is ones that have a, a big dash of both. 
It's correlated, we discovered most closely environmentally with just precipitation. The uh, dry areas of the state are, um, it goes back to something Stebbins used to write about, um, aridity as a stimulus for plant evolution. Uh, the dry areas of the state are fantastic. The one area with lots of endemism that's a wetter place is up in the Northwest. And then I'm not gonna have time to talk too much about beta diversity, but when you're considering biodiversity, there's alpha diversity, which is what most of us have been talking about today, which is how much diversity is in a particular pixel. And then there's uh, beta diversity, which is how much difference is there among different pixels. There is a phylogenetic measure of beta diversity, which is just like regular species beta diversity, except you're counting how many branches are shared and not shared among, among groups. And what we show there on the farthest right is not the phylogeny, but a cluster diagram that's showing which of the centers of endemism are most similar to each other and which parts of the tree they contain. So there were some interesting surprises there, which I don't have time to go into detail on. But I want to get to the latest paper, which just came out in November, late November, so it hasn't had a chance to get too digested yet. The, this paper is on linked to from the herbarium's website. In this paper, we shifted gears, and instead of looking at where are the basic patterns of biodiversity and endemism in the state, we instead are looking at a much more pragmatic view, which is what are the areas, once we consider what's already protected and what's available, what are the areas that are the highest priority for conservation? These, I haven't said yet, but these are 15 kilometer grid cells, which is the size we um, found would uh, be the smallest pixel size we could use with the data density that we had. So I don't have time to go into the three facets much, but if you are a phylogeneticist in the audience, um, and there are some here, you know there's more than one form of a phylogen tree. They can be made ultrametric, which means you've sort of calibrated them to time which is um, in the uh, upper right there. So that's kind of saying how long the lineages have been around, survival time. There would be an upper left, which you just use the molecular branch lengths, which is how fast is molecular evolution happening in lineages. So in that case, different lineages of the same age or perhaps different length. Or you could do sort of just a net diversification model, which is the lower left, which is just of the flora that's still remaining, how many divergence events uh, have led up to that. So that's the um, net diversification, survival time, and the uh, raw genetic difference. And then depending on what your goals are for conservation, you might want to emphasize one of those or the other. So if your goal is to conserve genetic diversity, which is what we use as our public justification often, then probably the one you want to use is the, the divergence one. It's almost the definition of genetic diversity. Whereas if you're interested in the sort of accumulated experience time that lineages have, you might be interested in their survival time. Or if you're interested in diversification as a process and you want to sort of preserve places where there's been high diversification, then we might want to go for that. So I um, only have a couple more slides. Advanced one. Maybe I'm done. Are you controlling this, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> um, is there somebody back there? <laughs> there's only there's just can you advance this one? You have to look on the website to see the punchline. So the punchline is then we evaluated the uh, California flora. We took into account using GIS, GIS techniques. We took into account uh, the protection status of land currently, the uh, intactness of natural vegetation on the land, whether there is still vegetation there that could be conserved. And then we use these phylogenetic metrics. Oh, there we go. 
there's the different facets, what they look like in, a, in the real phylogeny. But it's a very complicated algorithm, but we are taking into account protection status, the, uh, the biodiversity value, and intactness. And we're looking, the optimal conservation targets are ones that have areas that have poor protection, they do have intact vegetation, nat native vegetation, and have high biodiversity values by one of those three <coughs> metrics. So those are ones with long branches and small ranges, so a lot of endemism and poor protection across their whole range. And so this is the punchline. So the 50 highest ranking pixels for each of the three metrics are shown here. The ones in black are the highest with all three metrics. And then the ones with the other colors are high in one of the metrics, but not the others. And I've looked through these pixels. And you know the reason why they're mostly along the coast, there's a lot in that area right where we are right now, that's places where the land is not very well protected. So there's lots of uh, private land or BLM land or uh, places that don't protect their land very much. And when you, uh, when you look at the, each of these pixels, every one of them, you can just see like, okay, I see why that is. It's, those are very high biodiversity value and suffering um, from not being protected. While we were doing the study on um, using other criteria, the Nature Conservancy did uh, have that large gift of protect point conception. And I'll just show you, because I promised I'd show some of the hot spots, the Mount Hamilton <coughs> range. I'll be able to show that. Uh, our uh, foothills, the Northern Sierra foothills, Cape Mendocino, important area, and then Point Conception, which was just conserved by the largest gift, I think, for land conservation uh, ever by the, the Dangermonts, who uh, Jack Dangermont is the um, CEO of Esri, they have conserved um, Point Conception here. And then, just to finish, last slide, the, um, I think Jason showed this also earlier, on the UC Jeff's website, there's a little app that our graduate student Matt, Matt Kling wrote that you can explore the phylogeny in the map and you can change the facet and you can change the values for the different criteria and see what happens in your area and so forth and, and explore the data a little bit more. But I, uh, I feel that the approach is the direction we need to go to quickly uh, prioritize areas we don't have time to do it lineage by lineage. We need to do it flora-wide all at once, like right away in the next year or two, and then go out and save these lands, uh, and then worry about the other details later. Okay.